expiring Hooper pass. It used to be that Hoopers were a protected class in the shy. The same thing played out in many cities across the U.S. We had our own version of white privilege. Hooper props didn't just live on the court, but once you had put in enough work, you got a pass from coaches that were known to have a short leash, referees with a quick whistle, or teammates that were antsy to get the rock in their hands so that they could get busy. Nah, this privilege extended and was even granted by teachers that might be a little more patient with the ball player, or in extreme cases, turned that D into a B quicker than a youngster with a bright idea, a bad report card, a friend with good handwriting, and a parent that wished DCFS would. That was cool and all, but where these tokens really came in handy was the provision of safe passage throughout various hoods. As a young hungry hooper that might venture anywhere for a game, Shorty, get from brown here would be the warning to usher you out of a spot that was about to go up. At parties, you'd get dapped and head nods from the guys that came to dance, but it wasn't the cabbage patch or percolator that was their two-step, think one hit or quitter. I can recall my own Hooper Pass getting me in and out of Jeffrey Manor where I'd venture to see a girlfriend. Inevitably, some guy from the neighborhood would fall through to see her sister and hit me off with that G-check, only to find out we'd hooped at Cole Park a few summers back. Give and go, baby. No back door needed. Hoopers had a vast network of homies all across the city that would be impossible to amass without being some sort of public figure or a serial network marker that approached everyone with a question about their openness towards other income opportunities. Yo, where do you know dude from? Your non-ball playing friends would ask when you all journeyed to Evergreen Plaza Mall. <laughs> I hope you got that Hooper discount. Or maybe you guys hit the taste of Great America. The answer would always be Foster Park, YVI, Schusman, Gately, the Y, IIT, Marquette Park, Franklin Park, Eckersall, Kennedy King, 18th and State, West Portland, South Central, Marillac House, Loyola Park, the Dome, or some other hoop spot. Regardless, the relationship would come from doing work on the court together. Running off five straight with a guy could get you just as close as nearly coming to blows over aggressive defense and a claim of hacking. If you respected the guy's game, you respected him. Instantly, your nation of hoopers expanded. You had a mental Rolodex of names, faces, and games. As you all rose through the ranks and became competitors and teammates, the bond got stronger. I can remember many high school beefs being squashed because hoopers from rival schools knew each other and they could mediate a solution that always allowed that young male testosterone to put his frenetic energy into something more constructive or not. Regardless, the hooper card carried weight. Once you got into high school and started getting that ink, oh man, that visa turned into an AMX black card. Hoopers with pub will get that. Keep going, little brother. I like your game, stay in your books. That ball can take you all around the world. Use that game, don't let it use you. From the older guys with the funky walk like Rudy from Fat Albert. Tall, lean OG hoopers who still filled it up in the 40 and over leagues. These old heads recount how the hoopers past kept hood nations and organizations from giving them the ultimatum, plug in or plug out. The Invisible Hood Pass plays out beautifully in the 1975 flick Cooley High. Lead character Chief Jive Talk and ball player Cochise expertly flexes his hooper privilege with the ladies, teachers, adults, and other authority figures. Not only does it allow Cheese to skate by, but it also gives his homies some pixie dust they get to sprinkle here and there. It wasn't until the climax of the movie did we see gangbanger Stone and Rob shatter our false sense of security when Cochise meets an under the L supreme violation for a mistaken case of loose lips. Sidebar, the story goes that in real life, Rob and Stone were two notorious gangbangers from Cooper and Green. Recommended by the police when the film's casting director inquired about their desire to have real gangsters cast in the film. No wonder that scene felt so real. 
it would be nine years later that the Cooley High nightmare would touch the Chicago basketball community and send tremors around the nation, still felt up until this day. Biblically speaking, the number nine is a symbol of finality or completion. 25 or 2 plus 5 which equals 7 is the number of divinity. The death of high school superstar Ben Wilson who wore number 25 for Simeon High School would change the hoop community forever. The street life and the hoop life bumped heads. 1-0 for the streets. Everyone lost. During the 90s and early 2000s, hip-hop became more violent industry success seemed more obtainable via less expensive recording options for those one year. The NBA platform was huge and guys were going pro straight out of high school and getting paid in full. These two factors can make a bad cocktail for young people looking for a way out of poverty. The lines began to blur. Interstage left AAU basketball. Another exploitative tool in the system's arsenal to tap black gold even before it reached full maturity. High school coaches complained of losing quality players to the streets, as parks became spots for newly formed cliques to recruit, rap, smoke, and practice a stereotype of black male masculinity. The hoop games became less frequent. Parks became the place where rivals could run up on one another or a crowd of people if they were filled with that blind rage. Arguments that used to be settled with a one-on-one -on -one were now handled with a borrowed 22. You are more likely to see some action from a 44 than a 5-on-5. Five five. Park games consisted of ragged, half-high, drunk 21s and 32s between dice games, pill popping, and pulls from draw blunts. While the real hoop action was taking place in rented out gyms for AAU tournaments that featured teams sponsored by big brands, cold park hoopers now wore loose Gucci belts, white tees, and untied all-white Air Force Ones. More guys were slinging rock on the park bench than patting the rock waiting on the necks. Kids that were late bloomers and not involved in organized sports were misfits at the park. All too often the victims of assaults are chased off the court and out the park. Those that had come up with a love for the asphalt and still love the challenge of shooting outdoors, like IACB's own Lefty B. Boyd started outdoor tournaments where there could be an element of control to the environment but still captured the electric feel of street hooping. Lefty says, The Hooper Pass played a major role in the birth of my platform, the LEP Icky Summer League. The local soldiers granted full access to our neighborhood, even to different street organizations and rival hoods that normally wouldn't step foot on our land. This in turn saved a lot of lives over summer breaks. Newfound friends and relationships materialized, brokered off the framework of the dying hoop pass. 2011 was a great hoop year for Chicago. Guys like Wayne Blackshear, Ryan Boatwright, and 2013 number one pick Anthony Davis were holding down the high school hoop scene. However, it would be a five foot dreadhead that would lock the streets up like a Pat Beverly Tony Allen track. In the summer of 2011, the Chief Keef era would be upon the city. 13-year-old Darius Brown would meet the harsh realities of the expired hoop car. Darius was at Metcalf Park in Bronzeville doing the thing he loved to do more than anything when a group of alleged gangbangers shot into a crowd near the courts. The shooting was later discovered to have been a retaliation for the murder of a sister. Darius' mother, Stephanie Brown, recalled, The neighborhood kids ran to me. I ran up to the park. He was already on his way to the hospital. Brown said she was unable to talk to him. It was not good. They just couldn't save him. They did their best. Anybody who knew him, his classmates, his friends, his coaches were at the hospital. There was a certain peace, she said. I know he died doing what he loved to do. I guess you can't spell child soldier without the CHI. Fast forward to the last five years where order and structure are Chicago relics like head up fights and super transfers. 2016 is closing out as one of Chicago's deadliest years for violence since the New Jack City 90s with 700 murders on record as of December 2nd. There were bound to be some hoopers caught up in the madness, and there were. The 2014 shooting of 38 year old former Marshall point guard Sean Harrington shattered our backboard. My Whitney Young teammates and I spent four years competing against Shaky Sean and his commando squad. 
Although we were rivals, competing every year for the top spot in the Red West, always one or two games out of first along with Westinghouse, our teams had a bond and respect for each other that lives on to this day. We knew Sean had a warm smile, a quick cross in the heart of a lion. But it wasn't until we were all back home from college and more settled in our lives did we get to know the man intimately. Our Whitney Young crew would often gather and over time our PG on and off the court, Jelani Boleyn would include former foes turned friend, Sean included. It's clear from our interaction why Sean is pressed on. Ultimately paralyzed in his heroic effort to shield his daughter from the shooting that ultimately turned out to be a case of mistaken identity. Regarding the need to protect his daughter, Sean said, That's all that was going on in my head. Nothing else matters, period. We are a nation of hoopers, though. Our full strength was on display as fundraisers were started in the forms of reunion games, t shirts were made. But most of all, the community came out to show Sean love and lift his spirits. Sean Harrington has since returned to coaching, where he was named the 2015 NCAS Coach of the Year by his peers. Keep shaking them, Sean. Flagrant foul. Victim of homicide number 277 of 2016 was our out west brother Jonathan Mills, aka Jay Mills, gunned down over the summer before he got the chance to head back overseas and represent our nation. Uptown hoop legend Greg Tucker loved the game as much as he loved his young daughter, but that didn't stop someone from riding down on him this past October firing up to six fatal shots. His Northside hoop brother Bobby Dixon was saying in a Twitter post, bro, you was a good one. That hurts. Greg didn't deserve that. The game ain't fair. Elliot Brown was one of High Park and the low end zone, the supreme Southside dual citizenship. A little brother or nephew to the nation of hoopers. We all kept an extra saw buck in case we saw Joe, a grown man as he was known to us in passing. You got that. Joe was the Bo Jackson of De La Salle, graduating in 2008 after starring in basketball, football, and fresh. It was that demeanor and natural swag that had him driving a BMW coupe on the Skyway in January 2016 when he would lose one that had us wondering if we were more ELO than Jordan now. A black SUV. Yeah, it's always a black SUV, open fire, moving traffic, killing Brown and wounding his female passenger. Call the game, ref. They cheat. They're going to play like this. We don't want to play no more. Nah, man. F that. Get your man. There's three minutes left in the fourth. We from the crib, Joe. Let's hoop. Yeah,